Thanks for being here. Today, we're going to jump in and talk about winning, sorry, winning at winter gear. Uh, I know the challenges of getting kids geared up and getting outdoors. Um, it can be really overwhelming, both for the children and for the adults, honestly. And so we're going to take a little bit of time to chat about that today. I am recording this session uh, so that I can share it out. I'll put it on my YouTube channel, which has at this point, all of like three other things there, but um, something for 2023 that I plan on really building is my YouTube channel. Um, and I'm going to put it in our Nature Inspired Teacher group. So uh, likely if you're watching it, you either found it in one of those two places. But my name's April Zyko. It rhymes with Geico. Um, and it's a... Um, it's my husband's last name. I don't know why I always want to say that, but it's an unusual last name. It's Polish. Um, and it means rabbit. And I think there's so much that I want to share about this topic. I think it's so important to have conversations with people who are really, um, really doing the work of getting children outdoors and wanting to feel the support of others. Um, because when we see those obstacles, winter can feel like a huge obstacle in getting children outside. So I, um, I, I do teach a longer uh, workshop series that it will start uh, in January of 2023. It's called uh, Wonders of Winter, um, and it's a 10-week series, but this is just like a little snippet of just one of the pieces of that course. Um, but if that interests you, definitely check me out. I'm on, you can look at my blog at aprilsteachingtree.com, or you can follow me at um, April's Teaching Tree either on Instagram or uh, Facebook. Uh, probably where I'm most active is in our our nature inspired teacher group. And I encourage you to become a member of that. And I encourage you to ask questions there because it's a, it's a really good feeling to feel like there are other people doing the work that you're doing. Um, and this group is really encouraging and it's very inclusive in that some people who are in the group take children outside for long extended periods of time um, or have primarily outdoor programs and others are traditional teachers that are just wanting or just getting started on their nature inspired teacher journey and they you know just need that support to kind of feel that motivation to keep going particularly when things are hard and when there's obstacles um so just a bit about myself i live in northern vermont uh that is me um holding a giant um uh, block of snow on top of my head. And one of the things when I moved here to Vermont is I really needed to embrace winter because I grew up uh, on the coast, the East Coast in Delaware. And I like to tell people, um, you know, I really only saw about six to 12 inches of snow a year when I was a kid. And every time it snowed, it was snowman making snow because it was, it was that perfect, you know, you clump it together and it makes a snowball and you make snowmen. That's what you do with snow, or that's what I thought. So when I first moved to Vermont, I was totally shocked at the fact that most times it's not snowman making snow. And I had no idea of all of the different types of snow that there, you know, that existed. And I thought, wow, I've moved to Northern Vermont. Um, and at the time I had a one-year-old and now he's 17 and somehow graduating uh, high school this year. But um, I was like, I'm really going to need to embrace this and figure out how do I get comfortable um, with winter and how do I support him? So I love this quote. There's many different versions of it. There's no such thing as bad weather, uh, only unsuitable clothing. And that's probably, um, from my research, I think that's the uh, probably the origin of that uh, phrase. But I do think, you know, there we have to really help other adults and children to really embrace the idea that we don't have to wait for just sunny days, that we can enjoy all of the different types of weather. And you know what? There, some weather is hard. You know, going out on a you know, a blistery kind of day can feel really hard, especially those of you who have mixed age groups. It has a whole nother challenge and a whole nother barrier. Uh, for myself, I'm a nature-based early childhood educator. I work um, I'm still part-time as a preschool teacher. I work with ages three through five uh, in a public school program that is nature-based. Um, and I also have this opportunity to work with adults all around, you know, all around the world now um, who are wanting to bring this approach into their programs. And so, you know what? 
it's not all sunny and comfortable days. There are days that we do have uh, harder weather to contend with, but when we have the right gear and when we have the right mindset and when we've equipped the kids and help, help them to build their independence, we can just have so much more joy with it. Um, so those of you who are here with me live, you can drop in the chat box about what kind of programs you work in and what ages you work with. Um, and I also am interested to know is how long are you outside on a typical day? Now, this isn't a contest. I think it's really important that people realize that just the fact that we're getting kids outside every day is really important and there's no judgment. So if you only, you know, if you're in, in a in a situation where you can only get kids out for 30 minutes a day, that's okay. Make the most of that 30 minutes. Um, it, this isn't a competition. There are some people who, um, you know, are in our group who are fully outdoors and that's awesome. And they've gotten to the point where they have the, you know, the admin support, they have the family support and they're doing that as a full day. And I think that that's wonderful, but I don't want you to feel um, limited because you're only going outside for a portion of the day. I asked the question today because I want to know it helps me kind of frame up where are we going to spend, you know, who needs what kinds of supports? Because if you're only taking children outside for, you know, 30 minutes or an hour a day, it's much easier. Um, but when we're out for extended periods of time, it just, it does get a bit harder. So one of the things that I like to start with uh, in my classroom is to begin by reading some great children's books about winter clothes. Oh, <laughs> There's a typo there. Children's books. This is children's books are winter clothes. No, I should say children's books about winter clothes. I think you know what I meant there. Um, my favorite one, if you're only going to buy one, I would buy the first one if you don't already have it. It's called The Jacket I Wear in the Snow. And it's a cumulative kind of um, story where, you know, it, it builds upon itself. And I have a lot of fun reading this out loud. And the reason that it's my favorite is because that there's obstacles that the child in the story is facing. Um, this is the primary character of the story. One interesting conversation that comes up is um, oftentimes the boys of the classroom think that it's a boy and the girls think that it's a girl. And it's kind of neat because it never really uses the pronouns. So just kind of an interesting fact there. But one of the parts, um, it talks about this long underwear, bunchy and hot, that's stuffed into the boots too big for me, that cover the jeans, stiffen the knee, that go under the sweater all itchy and warm, that meets the, the mittens that hang from each arm, that I wear with the hat for my head that matches the scarf woolly and red, that's caught in the zipper that's stuck on the jacket I wear in the snow. So it's a cumulative book, so the text gets longer and longer. And I think it's great because there it kind of, you know, children do feel like the clothes are bunchy and that they're hot and they're a little bit uncomfortable there. And so I love using this book sort of as a jumping in point to talk about the sequence that we put our clothes on. Um, and then from there, we make a sequencing strip, which I'll share with you. I'll, sh I'll show you a link to where, um, where I print, it's a Teachers Pay Teachers link, but you can print a free visual um, to help kids with sequencing. What's neat in this story, if you're not familiar with it, is that um, the child goes outside and uh, has a little bit of a problem and they end up crashing. Uh, and it says, I have, uh, there are tears that fell from my eyes. And one of the things that I think is important to talk about with young children is that there are times when we feel uncomfortable outside. However, just like in the story, we have adults there that are helping take good care of us. And part of getting comfortable in being in outdoor class, you know, being in the outdoor classroom throughout the whole year is learning how to feel comfortable out there. And so, um, this is a great one. Froggy Gets Dressed is also a lot of fun to read. Um, uh, some of you from the Nature's Inspired Teachers group um, shared some books uh, that you said, you know, you've got to have these for talking about winter clothes. So Thomas's Snowsuit, I have on order, but it's not here yet. Um, someone told me about Mrs. Toggle's Zipper, which is about a teacher and her zipper apparently gets stuck. I haven't read the book yet. Um, under my hood, I have a hat and um, can be a great one. Um, oops, sorry about that. Um, and 
The last one there, what I wear outside in the winter is a book about uh, the Inuit. And so it has, it's just one word per page, but it has um, interesting words. It talks about like mukluks and things like that. And so it's neat to kind of have that conversation with kids that people all around the world are actually um, learning how to get dressed and go outside in the winter. So Think about sharing some children's books with your kids. Um, and then to me, one of the biggest points today is to really think about you want to develop a functional system for you. So I'm going to share what works for me, but I think that um, it's important to know that this isn't a one size fits all. You have to kind of tinker towards that utopia of finding a system that really works in your program. And what I like to think about is I do a lot of teaching up front and supporting the children, um, you know, at the beginning to really teach them and explain to them um, how to how to get themselves dressed independently. Um, and of course, providing supports as needed, but then also having that conversation with families, uh, that visual support strip, the visual um, sequencing to get dressed for outside. We, we color that, I don't do coloring sheets in my classroom, but this is one particular one that I do because it's a teaching tool. So we have the children color that, uh, we have them posted in our classroom and then it goes home and we talk to families about, we need you to be doing this at home too. Build in some extra time so that your child's learning these skills and is taking care of their needs at home as well as here in the classroom. Um, so those of you who are here live, drop in the chat box if you want burning questions that you have about getting outside in winter um, and obstacles that you have. And we will, I'm going to try to carve out time to go over those. Um, and a couple of questions also came in um, a little bit ago, uh, or people had sent some to me through email and uh, or in the DMs in Facebook. So I'm just going to give you a second to do that. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks. Um, so mindset is huge. I think it is probably one of the biggest things that we can do to set ourselves up for success is to really think about our mindset of the adults that are in the classroom. And some of you are home providers. So this is like just for you, your mindset and others are in programs where you have other staff members. And so there's, there should be a conversation about embracing outdoor winter play and kind of setting that expectation that we will be going outside. And so we want, we want the adults to be on board and supportive of that. Um, and you know, one of the things that I have come to find out in through these, you know, I've been in Vermont now 15 years, is that many parents, many family members don't understand about layering their child for going outside, how to do the layers. Um, but the same is true for adults and program staff. And so I've um, worked with, you know, assistant teachers in my own classroom, as well as um, programs that I support through professional development and coaching. And I come to realize that many adults don't understand how to layer. And so as, you know, as early educators, we um, don't have a huge budget and many of us don't uh, many of the staff members don't have really high quality gear for them, their own selves. And so what I think about is making sure that folks understand the importance of layering. So that means the staff understands it so they can be comfortable them, th for themselves being outside and that we explain this to families. And so we don't have to buy the most expensive outer gear, but we need to learn how to do layers so that we can feel comfortable. And layers are great because we can take them on or take them off. Those of us who are in longer, we're spending longer periods of time outside, um, you know, and as the, the temperature of the day fluctuates, as it warms up at midday, um, or as for those of us who are, you know, avid outdoor people who are, you know, doing, um, you know, movement kinds of sports, um, as you warm up, you want to be able to adjust yourself and having layers is really important for that. Um, so, Sharing resources with families and your, your staff about layering is really important. Um, 
one thing that many people don't realize is cotton is a really bad choice. Uh, you know, many outdoor folks say cotton kills, which honestly is a little bit dramatic. I don't think I'd necessarily put that in my family handbook or in my newsletter, but I think it's important mentioning to families that we want to wear fabrics, um, especially our base layers, where it wicks away sweat. Um, and so cotton, when cotton gets wet, it holds on to the moisture and it gets feels really cold. And so we want to think about our base layer and our socks in that, you know, we want something that's wicking. Uh, we also want to make sure that the clothes that children are wearing um, or adults, that they're fitting. We don't want them to be too tight. Um, we want, you know, our base layers to be snug on our bodies, but we want to be able to have a good range of motion and to be able to move around. Um, so sometimes it's like, you know, clothes that are too tight, children really feel that bunchy and hot sort of feeling from the, the children's book I shared just a moment ago. And the opposite is true as well. Many families will buy snowsuits that are like two sizes too big. And it's really challenging because then children don't have the freedom of movement because they, you know, they feel like that kid from the Christmas story who's so bundled up that he can't put his arms down, right? That it, the clothes are just um, too thick for them. And so we want to find sort of, I call it that Goldilocks rule where it's, you know, it's not, not too tight, not too big, but it's just right. And that can be hard for families. Um, and many of us are working uh, with populations where, you know, they're, they don't have a lot of disposable income to buy lots of different clothes for their kids. So we need to think about how we're supporting them. So with those base layers, or sorry, the three different layers, you have that base layer, which manages the moisture. It wicks away the sweat. So things that are synthetic um, are really good for that. And, um, you know, we can find I encourage the families that I work with to think about purchasing secondhand gear, um, you know, and because it's a lot more affordable. If you are buying a base layer new, really look at the tag and make sure that it's rated for cold temperatures because you want like that long underwear, a shirt and, and long underwear pants um, made out of a synthetic material that are also rated for cold temperatures so that you, um, you're really setting yourself up for success. Um, then you put a mid layer on, and that is a layer that helps with insulation. Uh, so for many people, you know, traditionally it would be a wool sweater. For me, I'm allergic to wool, so I can't wear wool sweaters or even wool socks with liners because I get, have allergic reactions. Um, but it could be a fleece, um, if nothing else is available, it could be just a traditional regular kind of sweatshirt. Um, if you have that base layer on that synthetic and then you have the sweatshirt over top and then you put on your outer layer and that outer layer protects you from the wind, the rain, the snow. Um, today we're having what we affectionately call a mixed bag day. It's like, you know, at first it was this lovely Hallmark movie, kind of lovely snow that was falling. And then it got kind of heavy and clumpy. And then all of a sudden it was like really windy. And, you know, it was like, wow, that would have, that would not feel comfortable to be out in that, that kind of wind. So outer layer can be, you know, an insulated winter jacket. It could be a insulated snowsuit, um, or it could be a jacket and bib snow pants, uh, depending on the ages of the kids. I prefer bibs for children. It's just easier to manage than um, snow pants that are at the waist. So I encourage families to, to send in bib snow pants if they can. There's a great resource called How to Dress Your Kids for Outdoor Winter Activities. I think it's a great idea to share with families as well as staff members. Um, and whenever I'm sharing a resource like that with them, with families, if I'm sending it to them via email, I like to really make sure that what I'm sending them is a quality website because this, the Wilder Child website is a great website and there's all kinds of great stuff there. So if they go, if they click the link in my, you know, in my e-newsletter and then they get that information where I send it, sent them to, they might click around and find some other things as well. Um, I prefer not to send them a link that there's a great article, like REI has a really good article about dressing uh, for winter. But when you send someone to REI, you know, it's like there, it's a, it is great information, but it's also marketing. And so it's marketing to really expensive gear. And so I like the idea for me in my practice, I prefer to send them to a website that kind of um, isn't, um, you know, marketing expensive gear. So that's a, a really great article uh, that you might have for families. 
I also like to think about doing a gear check. So just because a jacket looks awesome or a pair of boots looks really great, you want to make sure, especially if they're hand-me-downs, that you check in um, with kids. And so, you know, to make sure that they're warm enough. And for very young children, for infants and toddlers, you know, you might kind of put your hand um, in to feel the nape of their neck um, or do a hand check outdoors, like with your, your toddlers and your, well, infants, toddlers, or preschoolers, or even school agers, kind of just feeling their hands is a great way to kind of gauge age how their gear is is working for them um, and checking in like every half hour or so is a great idea um, when we come back inside at those first few snowy kinds of days where we have all the gear on I like to check the temperature of the kids hands and feet um, it just helps me to know is what they're wearing warm enough are their hands and feet feeling warm and if so that's kind of a good gauge to know, okay, th their gear is working for them. I also like to check, are their socks dry? Because sometimes, especially with hand-me-down boots um, or boots that have been used through multiple children, that they do get cracks. And sometimes kids don't necessarily notice that. So if we have, especially like a slushy day at the start of the season, uh, when we come inside, it's a good time to check their feet. Now, sometimes children, sometimes children's feet are wet, not because the gear, the boots aren't working, but because their feet are, um, their feet are sweating. And so either way, we don't want children's feet to be wet. So wool socks can be a, make a huge difference here. Um, or if it's a boot issue, you know, not using, maybe finding a different pair of boots for the child. Uh, or if it's because their feet are sweating, then you might um, want to have a liner a synthetic kind of liner sock that goes into uh, their socks so that they're not getting wet. With wool socks, they can feel really expensive, but children can wear the same pair of wool socks multiple times. Um, you could keep them in their cubby and they could wear them multiple times, um, you know, before they have to be washed, or at least that's what I think. Um, you know, maybe you think differently, but having socks can wool socks can be a great, um, a great things for kids. Those of you who are here in Vermont, we have a great company called Darn Tough Socks that um, oftentimes will do donations to particularly nonprofit organizations. So you might look on the donation uh, request list on the Darn Tough Socks website, which is these, anywhere you live, you can order Darn Tough Socks. They're a great Vermont-based company um, and they do donations to um, uh, particularly nonprofit organizations. So that article that I mentioned, mentioned is the second one there. And another article that I really like is um, by Get the Kids Outside. That article is neat because it talks about it's it's year round and it has it kind of it does talk about the different types of three layers to have and has some other information, but it has a neat little graphic in there that shows with different temperatures, like what kinds of things to, to wear, including summertime temperatures or warmer temperatures and the kinds of things that children need. So I find these two would be two great articles to share with families. They also would be good articles to share with your staff. Um, many people talk about, you know, well, how cold is too cold? For me, um, this is kind of subjective. And, you know, many programs do use the child care weather watch. Uh, for those of you here in Vermont, it's posted on the DCF website. Um, and so this is, you know, you'd want to print it out in color and use it as a reference. But I encourage you to remember that this is not a um, set in stone thing. This is like, a reference. It's not, it, it is not a, uh, you know, because it's a certain temperature, you are not allowed to go outside. That's not what it's saying. It talks about how you need to understand the weather and they do have it color coded. But if you're working, particularly, let's say that you have school age children uh, in an after school program, well, you don't, you might be able to go out in, if the children have the right kind of gear, um, you might be able to go out in, in colder temperatures than, than others. And so um, I know if early in my career, when I taught in Virginia, it was like, if it was below 32 and there was snow on the ground, it was a no-go. Like we just did not go outside. So when I first moved to Vermont, I was so amazed. Um, I observed, I was in a 
public school program for doing a little observation for two weeks in a preschool. And they had their system down, down pat, and they went out. The number at that school was 10 degrees Fahrenheit as their cutoff, uh, including wind chill. Um, and it was just awe inspiring to watch this teacher teacher uh, named Sharma get her kids ready and out the door. And I was like, I just kept, it was like February. So her kids were like really I guess when I was there, I wasn't thinking, oh, wow, they've had like two months of practice, but I was just in awe at how quickly she was able to get this and calmly get this group of children out the door and the fact that they played outside for an extended period of time, even though it was only like 10 degrees Fahrenheit out. So um, understanding temperature, communicating with families about temperature, communicating with your staff about temperature is important. Um, and what I find is often it's a an adult making a decision like, oh, no, it's too cold to go outside today because, you know, it's whatever. Um, it's like, well, it's really, there's so many wonderful benefits of going outside. So I, I don't want you to um, limit going, going outside because of, um, you know, lack of teacher interest. So what's your why for going outside, I think is a great thing to explore um, and to really communicate the value of what you believe about going outside. Um, to me, when I'm thinking about, like particularly with goals for getting winter dressing done, I it's really important to me as a preschool teacher that I'm building their independence in, in getting ready. I want kids to become comfortable outside. And I want them to become, you know, it's something that we can kind of build up over time, but I do want them to get comfortable being outside for extended periods of time. Now, I have the luxury in that I have, you know, I have a mixed age group, but it's only three to five year olds. So having infants and toddlers, you know, it, it's a game changer <laughs> because you do have to really think about for your non-mobile infants. Um, I'm not sure that we'll get to that today, but um, that's something that I like to, to have conversations about because um, you know, children who are not moving, they're non-mobile, they're not walking and they're stationary, they're gonna get cold a lot faster. It just makes sense. Same thing with kids who are able to move, but they're choosing to sit still. They're gonna get, they're like, oh, I'm so cold. I'm sitting here on this log and I'm so cold. And you're like, of course you are. You're not moving around. Uh, but our idea is that we want kids to get comfortable out there and we want children to learn how to communicate their needs and to seek the support that they need from adults. You know, it's okay if someone needs to come over and have a warm up hug or come over and tell me that they're not, you know, that they're, they're feeling a little bit cold, you know, and it's good for them. It's like all the social emotional skills that we want to work with children. And so communicating their needs is important having them come every day. So I was doing a training a few weeks ago and someone was like, what about the winter whiners? You know, <laughs> the winter whiners. And I was like, oh, I know who you're talking about. I've had them, but it's just, it's kids who haven't, they're not yet comfortable being outside because they haven't had the opportunity to. And I love the idea to think about how many snow years old are they? So if you have a kiddo that moves from Florida to your program in the Northern, you know, in a Northern snowy, climate, even if they're five or 10, if they've never experienced snow and they've not learned how to feel uncomfortable, feel, get comfortable in uncomfortable kinds of situations, if their snow years old is only like, this is only their first snowfall, it's going to take longer. And so to shift our mindset to think, okay, this kid is communicating with me that they're not comfortable. How can I support them rather than, um, you know, dismissing them? And I really want kids and families to understand the benefits of being outdoors in winter. And there, I, I have other articles that I can share with about that as well. Um, so to me, it's not about like survivalism, right? It's not, you know, and I do find like with some outdoor educators, you know, like with older, older age children, that it's sort of like this survivalistic kind of mindset of like, we're preparing, we're prepping them, you know, for, you know, any kind of emergencies and, um, you know, but to me, it's not like you're preparing young children for you know, natural disasters. Rather, we're preparing them to build their independent skills and being able to get dressed to go outside, to be a little bit uncomfortable, find things to do, find things to keep them moving, 
and to really to to really reap the benefits of being outside. So general emergency preparedness, having kids who know how to layer their clothes, who how knew know how to take care of themselves in those kinds of situations, that's a, that's important. Um, but it's not like we're doing a survivalist challenge where we are trying to get these kids geared up and, you know, we can't go inside for three hours because that's what we're doing, you know, and, you know, no, like that's not, that's not it at all. And so even if you are having to start with small parts of parts of time outside and then building, I think that that's important. Um, okay. Whoops. The, let's see. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but these are, um, some of the benefits, the physical development kinds of benefits from being outside in winter. Um, and we, we want kids, you know, if we're like, oh my gosh, they're bouncing off the walls. Well, great plan. Let's go outside. Um, there's a lot of physical benefits from being outside, moving their bodies, vitamin D. We know that, um, you know, fresh air is so good for kids. And so, you know, getting them out there just for the, the physical parts of it, I think is really important, but also social, emotional, learning how to care for themselves, um, you know, how to, you know, manage risk for themselves. If something's kind of slippery or they're going to go up a steep snowbank, you know, that risk and reward benefit is so different in the wintertime, learning how to advocate for themselves and communicating with the adults about how they're feeling, learning how to share and negotiate and problem solve, so many things. But particularly with getting gear on, think about all of the self-help skills that children are learning. It is, um, you know, taking the time to intentionally teach about getting ready to go outside, I think is really, it can feel cumbersome, like it's taking a lot of, a lot of time. And some of your kids will get it quickly and some will need more support. But just like anything else, we use it as a teaching time. Um, and I already mentioned this, but learning how to be able to enjoy yourself, even when you feel a little bit uncomfortable. So I'm not talking about like hypothermia, but just, you know, being outside and being like, oh, it's a little windy today. And it's like, oh, it is. Okay. What can we do to take care of our bodies? You know, if we have, if we can cinch down our hood, if we can close in, you know, our, our gloves so that snow's not getting in, if we can keep moving. So we're staying warm and learning those skills of how we manage and take care of our bodies is really important. Same thing with the kids who feel overwhelmed with the frustration of like, you know, they've got mittens on and they can't do the things that they normally do. Their fine motor skills and dexterity is so much less. Well, well, how else could we do it? Or maybe could we work with a friend to make that happen? So lots of different social emotional benefits are happening outside as well. Um, the truth of the matter is that you will have reluctant staff members. If you are working in uh, a school or a program, it's really quite possible <laughs> that you have multiple staff members who feel uncomfortable or are reluctant about going outside. Um, I did a whole recording about reluctant staff and it's in the Nature Inspired Teacher Group. So I'm not going to spend time really on it much today, other than to say, it, if you are hiring new staff, putting a question in there about the intro, you know, during the interview about, oh, we're a program that plays outside year round. How do you feel about that? You know, uh, have a written policy in your staff handbook about it. Model it your own self. Be that, be that person that shows up and, and helps support them and gives them ideas about how to, how to make things work. Um, and, you know, many, I already mentioned this earlier, but many early childhood educators don't have quality outdoor gear because it's expensive. So if you're writing grants to, you know, build a gear closet for the children, you might think about building some gear for adults or getting hand-me-down gear for adults, you know, and launder, washing it and having it fresh and having, you know, having it available to them. Uh, I know some programs have built in like a staff allowance uh, so that, you know, staff get a certain amount of money to purchase something. Um, and I know that we don't all have that in our budgets, but maybe writing some grants or doing some fundraising would be a way to help um, build a staff's capacity by giving them quality gear. Um, realizing I have so much I want to share and I feel like our time is going um, really fast. But Another great article, this is more for adults, but my 
experience is people who make that intentional decision to have a positive mindset about winter end up having a positive, having a better outcome during winter. And there's a great article um, called uh, The Norwegian Town Where the Sun Doesn't Rise. And it talks about the blue night or the polar night and how, um, how people have really embraced, um, instead of just tolerating winter, but how they really embrace winter. So this is a great article. And I also just read a book. Um, this is the link to the article. And um, I, so if you, or if yourself or someone that you're working with has a hard time uh, with winter, I think that's a really um, great jumping in place to have conversations about winter. Um, but I'd love to see in the chat box, you can chime in uh, about your own mindset about outdoor play in winter. Are you a zero? Like, you know what? I'd rather just not go out. Or are you like five? Like, yes, finally the snow's here. You love the time that you get to spend outside in winter. So you can drop that in the chat. Um, this is an excellent book. I just read this one. Um, it just came out uh, in November of 2022, um, but it's called The Open Air Life. And it is a Swedish woman who lived in uh, or lived in the United States uh, for a number of years and is now back in Sweden again. Um, and she is, if you follow the rain, rain or shine mama, M-A-M-M-A, -M -M -A, it's the same. She's the blogger and she's on Inst active on Instagram. But this is a really great read. It talks about um, the Swedish principle of outdoor living and how to really embrace it. Okay. Let's check in here. Okay, good. Um, so building a culture of year round outdoor play is a really great idea. Um, helping people to understand why you do what you do, I think is really important. So I just want to touch on that for a moment and then get to some of the, the nitty gritty. Um, Building this culture of outdoor year-round play is really about getting people on board with being outside in all weather. And so when I think about that, you know, it's like not just good enough for me as an individual, but to think about how do I get the children on board with this? How do I get them comfortable? How do I educate the families to say, this is what we do and why we do it? And for them to understand the value of it. And same thing with our staff. If you have reluctant staff, it's going to be really hard um, because, you know, you'll find on those days where it's a little less comfortable outside that they're like, oh, do we really want to bother with, you know, getting ready to go outside? There's so, it just takes so long to do it. And you're like, no, we definitely want to go outside. Um, and so getting them all on board, I think is important. Sharing photos of you and your students smiling and enjoying themselves out here, uh, you know, outside all all year long in all kinds of different types of weather is important. Um, last year, I took up ice fishing with my son. And I like to say, you know, when you want to spend time with your teenager, you you do the things that they, they're interested in doing. And so he really wanted to become um, good at ice fishing. So I was like, okay, I can't say that that was ever on my bucket list, but there, here we go, you know? And so it was, it was a great time. Um, and sharing the photos of us out there ice fishing, it was really fun to just hear some of the feedback of people who are like, I, especially people who live away, you know, who live in warmer climates, they're like, are you kidding me? It was what temperature? And I'm like, yeah, but we had a, we have this little pop-up shelter thing that's on the ice. We don't have a whole, like a, a metal one, but it's like a cloth pop-up sort of tent. And we have a buddy heater, which it actually is like a propane heater inside. And so it's very comfortable and we can get comfortable in being outside year round. Now I don't use those kinds of setups with my preschoolers in my school program, but I do think sharing photographs of, of how you spend time outside is really powerful. And it's that positive influence on others. And maybe they'll, they'll start to do it as well. Um, and then of course, sharing the benefits of, you know, of being outside, I drip that content out <laughs> like all the time in my social media with April's teaching tree, but then also for my preschool families and just putting little snippets in, you know, in the, in the newsletters that I send home or printing out short articles that were designed for families where it's like, it has another, you know, here's one more benefit of being outside. And one of the things that I think for reluctant families, they're like, not sure about this. 
really focus on what are their pain points? What are the things that, you know, are hard for them? And sleep is one thing <laughs> that um, children who are active outdoors in the wintertime have much better sleep because they have that exposure to vitamin D and the sunlight and the circadian rhythms that they have um, you know, there's, you can Google it and find some research or find some parent friendly sort of articles, but that being, being outdoors and active improves their sleep. And that is a huge selling point for many families. Um, and I think it's so important to talk about how being outside is part of your curriculum, because sometimes I'll have, uh, you know, assistant teachers or staff members in programs will say, um, well, yeah, but just staying inside, we can get a lot more done. And I'm like, a lot of what done? Um, you know, get it going outside is part of our curriculum. It's equally as important um, to be in the outdoor classroom as it is to be in the indoor classroom. Okay, I, I want to skip ahead here a little bit because I want to show my systems uh, for getting ready. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, I didn't, I don't know that we'll have time to talk about that. Let's see, moving right ahead here. Um, okay. So when I think about really winning <laughs> at, um, at this, you know, winning at winter gear, it really comes down to finding that functional system and really thinking, you know, there's probably three main things. One is your daily storage. Like how are you actually managing, you know, the gear itself and the transition with children? So probably like the storage and then the, the actual transitions, how you're supporting children during that. Um, and then a really big obstacle, and some of you put it in the chat, is the idea about donations, that having donations is, um, or having a system so that you're gathering a, a class set of gear is really important. And I'm not really sure that we'll be able to get to that today, but I do have a lot of thoughts about it. So that definitely could be a conversation for another day. Um, so the systems that you come up with, I like to think about you're creating that system for you. And I like to think about functional systems. I talk about functional systems in a lot of the courses that I teach because you could you could think about some grandiose, amazing system, but if it doesn't actually function for you, then it's not worth putting the time and energy. Um, just like, you know, you could write out some beautiful lesson plan, but if what's functioning within your classroom, um, you know, it's like real life, making it really work. And so I want to share some pictures with you. Um, I do think it's important to remember that every program's unique. There's no one size fits all with this uh, when we think about the whole winter gear management. I do think kind of having a look at your space, the furniture that you have, the children in your program, the ages of the children in your program, and putting time in now at the beginning of the season to really plan and think about how how are we going to do the transition to get outside and the transition to come back inside and then try it out. And it's that whole tinkering towards utopia idea that we are going to try this system out and see how it works and then tweak it until you find what works best for you. Um, I like to keep myself some notes and some years I'll tell you that it's like, oh, wow, this, we got this, you know, we've only been working on this for a week and a half and we've, almost got this down pat with, you know, just a couple, one or two kids or just a handful of kids who need extra support. Um, other years, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, how long is it going to take until we, um, you know, have, have this down? One of the things that I like to think about is within that functional system is to remember that it is a teaching time. So make yourself a little list. Um, I don't have a slide of it, but I, I wrote it in the Nature Inspired Teacher Group, I think last week, or it was in the newsletter too. I send out a weekly newsletter. If you're not on it, you could always DM me or, um, or put in the chat your um, email and I can get you on the email list. But write yourself a list of all of the skills that children are learning during that time, because that transition to get ready to go outside is a huge learning time. Kids are learning all different kinds of skills. And so writing down what they're learning can help you remember why it's important to go ahead and take the time that you need um, to, to teach kids um, these skills. Okay. 
a few more slides and then I'm gonna, I want to show you the system that works for me. Um, okay, and then we'll wrap it up there. I, uh, I'm looking at the time and it's, it's like, oh, it's going by so fast. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. So many of our programs have wooden cubbies, you know, depends on what your layout is and, you know, kind of works differently at different programs. Generally, children get um, dressed at their cubbies, though what I find is I observe kids closely. This is not my classroom. This was this is a classroom that um, actually, uh, I think it might be, I think it might be Bulch, but I'm not 100% sure. But look at these cubbies. How many, how would you have uh, those are shared cubbies too, I think, but you couldn't have all of the kids getting dressed at the cubbies. So what you want to think about is how a good idea is to figure out systems so it's not so clustered. The kids who need the most support, getting their gear out of their cubby and into a different part of the classroom um, is important because they're not, they'll be, you could, you could move their gear or eventually maybe they could move their gear to a to an assigned part of the classroom. Uh, for kids who have sensory overload, being an acquired quieter part in the classroom sets them up for more success because they're not overwhelmed by their classmates. Um, kids who are really bothered by other people touching them, um, you know, can be moved to a different part of the classroom. And this isn't a punishment. This is like setting them up for success. Uh, for those of you who do Eckers, you know, we have this, those, you know, <laughs> we have this thing where gear, children's gear is not supposed to be touching other children's gear. And that is really hard, um, especially with wooden cubbies. So maybe thinking, um, you know, thinking about systems where you store them in a different way, because once all the wood, once all of the winter gear gets in there, it's virtually impossible uh, for the stuff not to touch other children's cubbies. So if that's important to you, you know, keep that in mind. Another thing is that, um, you know, well, I have so many thoughts I want to share, but this particular, these cubbies are too narrow for me. Like I want wider cubbies. I do love the three parts of the kinds of cubbies so that children can put their boots at the bottom. They can hang up their stuff, um, you know, their jacket and their bag and snow pants in the middle. And then they can put the, the other things at the top. Um, we do know that cubbies are really expensive. They take up a lot of space, but um, these, you know, having a system using the cubbies and then staggering where kids get dressed, I feel like is, is a system that works well for me. In my current classroom, the bottom part of those cubbies, um, mine are much wider than these, but the bottom part has this little carpet square in them. And I don't know who came up with it, but it's quite brilliant because when kids put their snowy or muddy or gritty kind of sandy boots um, into their cubbies, it lands into that um, little carpet square and I can take them out occasionally as needed and shake them out outside. Um, and I think it's just brilliant. It's one of those little things. And I wish I had, I don't have a picture in the slide deck, but um, it's just a great idea. I think it's a brilliant idea. Um, so sometimes we have cubbies that just have the two partitions. Obviously this picture, the stuff doesn't have, uh, they don't have their um, winter gear in here, but even you can just see these cubbies are really not working because just the jackets alone are sticking out from the cubbies and, and gets really kind of clustered in there. Um, this is another um, classroom. And um, this one, what I was, the reason I put this slide in here uh, is this cubby on the left-hand side, if it's kind of hard to tell, but it actually is built in a way that there is a seat here. So kids, if they want to, can kind of turn around, sit down on there, take off their boots and, um, you know, change or take off their inside shoes, change into their boots or vice versa. And so this kind of cubby that has, like, if you were in the market to actually upgrade, to me, this is wide and it has the place that it can sit down. Um, of course, if you do Eckers, the kid's gear is going to touch. So I don't know, but I just put that in there because I thought it was neat. This other kind of cubby here, um, it has a little bit of space, but it's not quite the same as having sort of that built-in bench. Um, so the, that's one thing that could work. Um, one of the systems that I love is to buy a garment rack. I want to show you this picture here. So this is zoomed in. This is a garment rack. And it's the one <laughs> that price is now, I was just at Walmart the other day. I forgot to fix it on the slide deck. Um, it's $69 at Walmart. And the 
you if you Google it, um, you know, I'm sure you could find it other places besides Walmart. I love this one because it has two rods and it is, you can fit, you know, I have currently I have 15 kids in my preschool classroom, but in this photograph, this was in a classroom of 19 and I had 19 kids gear on here and it worked. So the system, um, this, this rack has wheels on it. So you can move it out in and out or move it to different parts of the classroom. So after we finished in the morning, we would hang up our snow pants on our, on the hangers. And trust me, the kids can become independent at doing that. Preschoolers can anyway. And then wheeling it over near the heater so that in the afternoon on round two of going outside that their snow pants were dry. Um, and it is possible. And so if you are, if one of your obstacles is morning and afternoon, this might work for you. Um, I use these kinds of hangers uh, because the snow pants don't slip off. So the snow pants um, have that, you know, like a, I'm not sure what it's called, but sort of like that indent in the hanger so that the snow, the straps of the bibs uh, fit on there. Sometimes, occasionally, a parent will send um, regular snow pants without bibs and we use them. But I find for that age group, bibs are so much more comfortable for kids. Uh, so I usually have a lot of extras and offered to kids if they want to switch to bibs that they can. Um, here's another picture of uh, another example of one of these kind of wire shelves. You can find these on, um, on Amazon or big box stores, but I really like also having this wire rack um, sort of at the bottom. Uh, I don't put the kids boots on there, though you could, um, but I usually use it for putting um, sort of like extra things that have gotten wet. Uh, for the boots, I usually put them in a plastic snow, um, a plastic boot tray. This one also has a roof, uh, not a roof, but a rack on the top. And it has some of these arms that kind of swing out. So this is another idea um, that could give space for even a large classroom of kids. Uh, the wire rack for me or the garment rack has worked really well because uh, I can wheel it around. Like I said, I can move it to where the dryer is. I can put it in different parts of the classroom. It has a lot of flexibility for me. So I use the um, the cubby, the wooden cubbies for kids to mostly store their things and then use the garment rack. And I use this hanger idea. Now, I know this doesn't work for everyone, but for me, having a pair of snow pants, a hat, and a pair of mittens that stay at school is the system that works best for me. Um, I ask families if they want to leave an extra pair of snow pants in the classroom. Um, and I usually have about maybe half that choose to do that. Some don't, but I have over time, and I'm not going to get to it today, but have through donations um, or grant writing, mostly for me through donations, have gathered up a class set of, of gear. So that works for me. Um, but having the hanger where each child has their own hanger, this one wasn't labeled, but um, you put everything that's going to stay at school to dry for the next day. So if you're um, only taking one trip outside, um, you could do it and then it stays on the drying rack until on the garment rack until um, the next time that they come to school. These these materials don't travel to and to school and home. So the snow pants, you know, are on the hanger. We use the the two clips that come with the um, the hanger for their mittens, and then I add on that white clip at the top um, as an additional little spot where we can hook on. Um, the hat. And then children, of course, wear their jacket and their boots back and forth from school to home. Um, in my program now, it's, we can't start our day outside. Years ago, I was able to, for multiple reasons, I'm not able to start my day outside. Starting your day outside is a quite a cool option because families um, gear up their kids and they get right to play outdoor play uh, when when um, they arrive, which means you can have often have an ex more extended period of time out there. Um, now that may not work as well for you know mixed age groups with infants and toddlers, but for preschool it worked really well for me. Um, and then what I found is we had less transitions because we would start our day out there, we'd be outside for extended period of time, then we would come in. Um, but anyway. 
For families though that um, can't afford duplicates, I have figured out ways to um, ask friends for donations, put out appeal um, for donations, and I just have a class set. So this is to me one of the easiest uh, fixes. I also do have an extra gear shelf. Um, this looks like pretty slim pickings because, um, you know, we don't share hats in particular because of um, the worry of lice. Uh, but having extra gear, I think, is really important. I have these open shelves, uh, and I have these shelves are close to where the families, it is the area where families drop off. So they can kind of also see, like, um, you know, how much you know, how much extra stuff you have uh, and can kind of help, you know, if you put a wish list out, you can ask families uh, for support. You can take a picture of, of the kind of help illustrate what you have and what you need. Um, and they kind of understand that if they're not sending gear from home, we don't have an endless supply of gear. And so, you know, having that communication with families is important and um, having ongoing conversations with families about that is important. Okay. Um, Having some system for drying, you know, mittens on the heat heater vent is a really great solution. Um, ha hanging them up on the hangers is what I do, or using um, 3M hooks can, because if you stuff everything into the cubby, as you know, it, it just, it won't dry um, evenly. So instead having places within your classroom, so, you know, having some designated places where mittens can dry, designated places where things, you know, get hung up, these are actually smocks. Um, but the idea is there that you could you could hang up your gear. I also like having a clothesline, um, uh, hang it somewhere that's in a little bit of a warmer area, uh, low enough for the kids. Uh, one of the kindergarten teachers that was um, in one of my groups last winter, she had this idea, which I loved was, um, it doesn't, it's not illustrated in this photo, but she said that she has a glove helper and she tells the glove helper um, how she wants them to hang it up and they do like a pattern activity. So, um, you know, they might do like an AAB pattern with glove glove hat. Um, and I just thought that was neat because she throws a little math activity in with uh, drying the things. These little fabric drawer organizers, now this doesn't work for wet stuff, but for dry things, um, this can be a great way that you could kind of put, you know, certain type of mittens in one and certain, you know, hats in another one. And so it's really easy to, for you to see like what, you know, where stuff is and, and how, how to find it. Um, and uh, I think that it helps finding, especially if you have different size gear for different size kids, like sorting it, you know, by size might make it a little bit easier. Having a boot tray when we come inside is really important. This catches the snow. And so uh, we come inside and take off our boots. And uh, just as soon as we come inside the door, the boots come off, they stay there. And then kids walk to their spot, whether it's at the cubby or a different designated spot in the classroom to take off their gear. That really, having the boot tray really helps keep our classroom dry. And it prevents like that grit, you know, you can see in the boot tray there, like grit and sand that kind of comes in. Uh, boot trays are pretty inexpensive uh, and um, it just saves the classroom and it keeps the classroom a lot drier. I like to make sure that I'm training the adults on that too, because we'll have adults that come in, whether it's families that are dropping off or other staff members, and they walk through our classroom in their snowy boots. And then our classroom is, you know, um, kind of wet, but I think the the boot tray definitely helps. Okay. So I'm looking at time and I think what we're going to do is um, we're going to wrap it up here. I'm going to stop recording, answer um, a few other questions. Uh, and uh, if you're watching this on the replay, I encourage you to drop your questions either in the Nature Inspired Teacher Group or send a DM uh, or email me. Uh, my email was at the beginning on the beginning slide. And I think I've got lots more ideas, but this is just sort of a snippet. And um, I hope that, uh, it, you know, I hope you think, you know, about mindset and shifting your mindset and really finding uh, something that works well for you. Thanks so much for watching. Bye-bye.